Yeah. yeah. Hey folks, uh, we're back live with the dev stream. We're doing another walkthrough Wednesday today. Uh, we're here with our guest Eve Porcello, which we'll get to in a second. Um, uh, before that, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Nick Taylor. I'm a senior software engineer here at Forum. Forum is the software that powers dev. And as always, I'm here with Christina Gordon, my co-host. Uh, you wanted to say a couple things uh, before we get to our guest, uh, Christina? Yeah, so my mom is still here. There may be a sloth again, probably not. Hopefully no sloth interruptions this time. I'm Christina Gorton, the open source community manager at Forum. And yeah, last week we had a sloth incident. Hopefully that won't happen again. So uh, if there, at this time though, Nick will have someone to talk to if I have to go away. So it could be okay. I could go invest with the sloth. Yeah, yeah. Maybe and, bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of somebody to talk to, we're here with Eve Porcello, uh, Porcello sorry, today. Uh, Eve, do you just want to say a few things about yourself? And then uh, we're going to jump right into it. Sure. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Eve Porcello. I am the, uh, I'm a teacher, software developer with Moon Highway. And we teach kind of JavaScript and Node and GraphQL and React courses to engineers. So very stoked to be here. Cool, cool. All right. Nice. Well, I guess we'll get into it. Uh, I was thinking we could talk mm -hmm. uh, a bit about your career, maybe, uh, uh, and then maybe we can talk a bit about like the teachings you do, and then uh, if uh, if you're up for it, maybe talk some GraphQL. Totally. Yeah. I'm going to cough. <laughs> What's that? You get a cough? Okay. So. <laughs> Okay. So, That's allowed. So, yeah. Well, Christina's choking. Uh, if you just want to say okay. about your career, coffee went down. There. I was about to ask her a question, but I had also <laughs> drink some coffee. Um, you know, coughing right now is like a horrible thing. You can't like cough without like feeling like you have to warn everyone that it's okay. I'm okay. It was just coffee. So. Eve, uh, instead of us just saying, hey, we want to talk about you, let's actually start this out a little bit. Um, kind of want to start with, like, where did you start with development? Like, wh where have you come from in your development career? Let's start there. Where have you come from? Um, so <laughs> I went to school in Chicago for, I got a history major. I didn't really know what web development was uh, at all. Um, I moved out to Seattle and then I realized, like, every job is a tech job there. And I sort of tangentially worked in various roles. So project management and kind of got into UX design, user interface design, and over time started to work on projects with a lot of developers. And I sort of, my husband was a web developer and he was always like prodding me to join the family business. Like, let's start a business and we'll be consultants together. And I was like, no, we're never going to work together. It's not going to happen. And uh, yeah, I think over time, because we moved to Lake Tahoe, where there's, especially at that time, not a lot of jobs in tech that's sort of starting to change these days. Um, I needed to make up a job so <laughs> I was like yeah we should do this and kind of started to learn html css and javascript along that time and really we worked on a lot of like straight up consulting projects building websites mm -hmm. and things like that and then got into more teaching so alongside learning stuff I was teaching a lot so I think that has helped my career quite a bit just uh yeah. kind of getting up and trying to explain stuff to people who are just learning it and having to explain things as you both know is yeah. the tricky yeah. part and uh, <laughs> if you can explain it then uh you probably will know it too so, so yeah. like pretty deeply and and you wrote yeah, a book as well I think. yeah so we wrote learning react in let's see 2017 it came out Okay. Um, and then we just rewrote that book for hooks and all the new things that are part of the React library. And then we wrote a book on GraphQL as well. So we're in GraphQL, uh, another O'Reilly book with animals on it. Um, <laughs> one has Which animal did you get? I don't oh, know okay. what that says. Yeah, one, let's see. 
This one has pigs on it, which por- nice. porcello, which <laughs> is how I pronounce my name, but you should pronounce it porcello. And that means little pig in Italian. So I think that's kind of fun. Okay. And then there's like a nice bird. This is a Portuguese version of this book. I don't know where the English version is. I don't know what this says, but um, <laughs> that's a more majestic bird. Second time around, we got a little, a little nicer. So, um, so yeah, it, it's been. We kind of got into React while teaching at Yahoo. They were migrating from their library called YUI over to React, and we're like we don't know what that is, we should find out, and and, uh, kind of got in on that early due to just being in the right place at the right time. Nice. So a question I get a lot, because for those who don't know, Eve has done courses um, on a couple different places. She's worked with LinkedIn, she's worked with Egghead, probably other places I'm not even like mentioning here. A question I get sometimes because I've done similar is how do you, how one, Okay, so uh, from your perspective right now, from what I gathered, you you were learning and you decided to teach while you were learning. Is that how you got approached by these people? Did you did you go out and uh, try to approach them and start working with them, or did they kind of reach out to you? So right after we found out what React was, we <laughs> had wanted to do <laughs> classes on L- Linda at the time. Yeah, and we came LinkedIn Learning really shortly mm-hmm. after we built our first classes, but. Yeah, that was that was literally just finding a link on the website and being like, can we do this? And they were yeah. like, we don't know. Send us a video. So yeah, um, I literally just found this because I was looking for something in an old Dropbox and I was like, these videos are in here. So I'll never show anyone that video because it's really not uh, not what I, I would <laughs> like those too. <laughs> I've practiced a lot in five years. Like that's um. I, I'm very lucky to have had that opportunity um, because I don't know that that video is the best. Um, but yeah, it was an audition process. We made kind of a four minute video, I think it was, and sent that in and um, then went through the whole process. We were kind of talking before we got on about like going down to LinkedIn and you had to do the on camera part in front of a green screen, like someone does your hair and you feel like a weirdo. And, uh, <laughs> but it was super fun. And uh, yeah, it's been, that's like one of the biggest, uh, nicest opportunities we've had is just that mm-hmm. um, <laughs> making those videos. Cause it was like, oh, we can maybe do this as a job. So yeah, um, very thankful to. <laughs> Linda herself yeah. and LinkedIn, <laughs> all those people. <laughs> so, it, it, is it, it, this is a probably I probably know the answer, or but but is the site called was called Linda.com because it was Linda someone who started mm-hmm. it? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, um, she kind of made videos on this small site for how to build her website, and so um, that kind of exploded into this thing it is now, which is. They have courses for everything. When I went down to record, actually, there was a guy who was m- making like a guitar class. And I was like, this guy's yeah. much cooler than me. But um, <laughs> they have a lot of good courses on all sorts of different things. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. That, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, because I, I remember. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're. Ha- I think there's a slight delay today. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, okay. I remember first hearing about you. I think from React, because like, I've been doing React since like 2016, and I remember. Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember if if it was you. I found out about you because you were starting to do React, or if it was when. Because I, I don't remember when GraphQL came out, but I, I definitely know you from GraphQL stuff. But uh, I'm trying to remember if it was one or the other that came first for you when. Uh, because how old is GraphQL? Because I mean, I know it came from it came from Facebook, so it's got to be like mid twenty fifteen or something or sixteen. Yeah, it was open source in twenty fifteen. So um, React was a little yes. earlier. We were uh, doing a lot of React stuff first, and then got into GraphQL shortly thereafter. Well, speaking of GraphQL, and you're getting into it, you have kind of a bigger project lately, the GraphQL workshop which I will link to the site again. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Like, was that a collab? I can't remember. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I know Egghead has been doing collaborations with other people. Was this a collaboration with Egghead or is this just your thing? 
<clears throat> so it's what Joel Hooks, the co-founder of Egghead, calls the Webass courses, the West Boss <laughs> as a service courses, where they nice. focus on the content creation and then they kind of build this whole marketing engine around it and build a cool looking website. If you see the website, it looks really good. I have literally yeah. nothing to do with that. So um, <laughs> they have a really crack team of designers who really know how to know how to dial up the, <laughs> the design on that. So yeah, I, awesome. I, do you want to talk about it a little like uh, what what like what is it? What are you going to be doing with it? Is it you teaching GraphQL? Like, do you want to kind of give a spiel on it? Yeah, so it's basically the goal is to teach everybody how to build a full stack app with GraphQL. So it's something we've, graphqlworkshop.com actually used to be our, like how we would go teach courses, public workshops okay. to people. And okay. that site looks like trash because we built it. And um, <laughs> I think <laughs> we designed it. Um, but I think, yeah, we were able to go on all of these workshop tours all over the US and teach GraphQL to all these different people. And we've learned a lot about how people are actually using GraphQL at work. And GraphQL has matured a lot in the last five years. There's all mm -hmm. these awesome tools in the ecosystem and things like that. So it's really intended to give people a a look at how to build a full stack application. So we focus on like building a server, building a schema, getting your client connected, and then uh, getting handling things like authorization and federation to scale your API and things like that. So uh, it's a really big video class, basically, a uh, really long in-depth class. If you've heard of like testing JavaScript or uh, yeah. Epic React from Kent C. Dobbs, it's kind of the same idea. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, I, I have both those. They're, uh, well, well, Kent's <laughs> a machine to begin with, but uh, it, it's yeah. really it's really great content. And uh, it, it's kind of neat, like you said, the the West Boss is a service platform because uh, it, it, it's done really well. Like, because uh, it, it's, well, for folks who are watching, if you have an Egghead account or even if you've watched some of the free content, it's, it's pretty much the same setup in terms of videos, but then it's it's got a lot more to it i find like at least i know in the epic react stuff it's it's a lot more hands-on than the uh just typically watching a video and then like hey you learned it and go go do something uh so uh, is it yeah. going to be that kind of style too or uh, so we're there's going to be a lot of extras included so hands-on activities and there will be a podcast i don't know if i'm supposed to talk about that but oh, i did um uh, <laughs> hot, hot goss um yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think that yeah it will go through the process of building a camp application so like for a summer camp so we have counselors those are egghead instructors and uh we have what else oh i remember you asking about this like a long time ago in the egghead yeah. slack <laughs> yeah my timelines are interesting but um yeah we have all sorts of activities and it'll just be uh basically an app for how do you manage your camp activities so if you're if you want to sign up for tennis or canoeing, things like this, you'll do that. <laughs> so I, I heard the tennis is really good. So definitely sign up. Tennis is really good. I agree. I agree. It's a good one. So if you have a favorite camp activity, you can drop that in the chat and we'll make sure to include it in our data set. <laughs> All right. Now I need to know, did I make the cut as an instructor? Because now I'm curious. Now I'm going to have to get this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Is this? Of course you did. <laughs> Oof, that, almost, that almost got awkward. Almost got awkward. Uh, uh, actually, the review process, <laughs> I have some bad news. No, anyone who gives me data to populate, I'll do it. Okay, someone said archery needs to be included. Archery? Uh, of course. Archery, I like yeah. one. I agree. Archery is a good one. So. I don't yeah. think I've ever participated in archery. Did you go to summer camp when you were a kid? I didn't, but at school, in middle school, they had all of us middle schoolers during PE play do archery, which just seems like a bad idea at this point, but we did do archery there. Yeah, it does feel like a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Point, point arrows at each other. Have fun, kids. Uh, yeah, it's fine. 
<laughs> Collect your arrow while everyone else is shooting. Yeah, that's bad. Did you ever go to summer camp, Nick? <laughs> uh, I did, and uh, it was a Christian summer camp uh, because my mom was a director. My mom's a minister now, but uh, I, I'm not. I'm not really religious myself, but uh, because she was the director and she had to take care of me i had to be at the camp so uh but i had honestly i had it was it was fun experiences there was all kinds of stuff uh you know there was uh swimming you know crossing train tracks when you're eight years old to get to the lake which is probably illegal now but uh you know stuff like that and there there was archery and i i forget who i was talking to the other day it was in my virtual coffee group but the do you, or, or no, I was talking to Kyle Shevlin and we were, he's, we were talking about lawn darts. Did, did you ever have lawn darts at your house? They're just like... No. Okay. Is lawn darts the thing where you like throw up in the air? Like this seems like the most dangerous game yeah. in the world. I have not played this, yeah. but I have heard about they, it. They, they came out in like the 80s. They probably died out early 90s. But it was essentially like picture like like a movie, you know, when they have a rocket launcher, like the bad guy, it literally looks like the tip of the mm -hmm. rocket launcher. You just swing it up in the air and you have to get it into this hoop. And it's like, there's like eight of them, I think. And you're, you're just there with your friends and the thing, like you can literally impale somebody with it. So like, it's amazing that none of my friends died, but it's like, uh, it's, I'm sure it's definitely on the, uh, not safe for kids list now, but, uh, yeah, good old, Good old yeah, that's camping. very upsetting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, yeah, get uh, get back All right. to <laughs> moving moving on from the summer camp. I mean, we can keep talking about summer camp because we're talking about GraphQL. But okay, so kind of a summer summer transitions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome <laughs> transition. <laughs> So if you do go to that website, it's talking about uh, it's coming early 2021. So we are talking about this right now, but it's not necessarily a thing. But Eve, you do have courses and videos and things on other platforms. If people want to watch, where should they go to find some of those things before we transition to other stuff? Yeah, so you can go to LinkedIn Learning. Uh, that's where I have several React courses. Um, well, all of them have just been rebuilt, actually, to include okay. the latest things. Um, we also have a GraphQL course there and then some others. On Egghead, if you're newer to GraphQL, um, I have a GraphQL query language course there, and I think that's a good place to get started. Um, I got started with GraphQL in the wrong way, which was to <laughs> get overwhelmed by this huge ecosystem of tools, and I felt like uh, this seems, I don't know if I want to get all involved in this. So um, I think focusing on the query language first is a good way to get started, just so it's like you can send a query and get some data back and something has happened and it doesn't feel quite as daunting. So uh, that's a place you could get started. Um, there's a lot of other resources for GraphQL too. How to GraphQL.com, other things. I have nothing to do with that, but that's just a good one. <laughs> And and I haven't really done any, like we were talking briefly before, I haven't really done any GraphQL aside from a bit in my Gatsby site. And uh, I had taken one of your courses, a, I think a couple months ago, the the intro course there. But there's, there's a different, like for the folks at home, there's a difference between, there's the GraphQL spec, like the language and all that. And then there's the technologies that implement it, right? There, it's not, it's not like this is GraphQL. It's like, this is something that implements the spec that is the technology, right? Uh, that's exactly right. So the spec itself, when GraphQL was open sourced, uh, they released the spec, which describes like the query language, how to write a schema. So two different syntax languages for both of those things. And then they also released a reference implementation in Node.js, meaning this is how this is one way to potentially build a GraphQL API server, but um, a lot of other folks have used that as a guide to create all of these many tools that exist in the ecosystem. So um, if you're a JavaScript developer, that's good because there's a lot of tools for that, but you don't have to think, oh, I don't know JavaScript, I don't like JavaScript. 
I know it's shocking, but uh, <laughs> some people might say that, uh, that you can use C++, Python, <laughs> you can use uh, all these different languages to build a server. So um, a lot of different options. Okay. And uh, like, from what I know about it, like the, it, it was, it came out of Facebook. So the, I, I saw it first appear in, in React, in the React landscape in, in that community. But uh, I know I haven't used it, but I know GitHub exposes an API with a GraphQL API. So do, like, do you know of like other, I guess, like do people in Angular use GraphQL? I, I'm sure they do. It's just like, I don't know what the clients are and stuff. Cause I, I've only heard of the React ones like Apollo or Urkel and there's probably others too, but. Uh... Yeah, so I think it has been associated with the React community quite a bit because yeah. React people work with GraphQL people at Facebook and then they go to the conference together and they're like, <laughs> we should all talk about this. But I think the appeal and the applicability of GraphQL to all sorts of different people is much broader than that. Um, you can use GraphQL really with anything. You could use it with Angular, with Vue. There's a lot of tools that help make those uh, connections easier, make setting up a project easier. But yeah, you don't have to feel like, oh, if I don't use React, I can't get a ton of benefits from GraphQL. GraphQL is used in wildly different ways. Like the spec you mentioned, it talks about this query language. So I can write some queries and get some data back into whatever app I want. And um, there's a lot of flexibility there for, for good and for bad in many ways. But I think like, uh, it does allow anybody to use it. Okay, nice. <clears throat> and and unless you have another question, Nick. I uh, no, I, I I I went like that because I knew you were gonna say something. <laughs> Just pulling back, pulling back. We're, we're getting better at this. <laughs> so, and this is kind of putting you on the spot somewhat, so you don't have to. Would you like to show us like maybe the, you know, GraphQL language a little bit and maybe what you might do, like just an example of like, how would you use it for people who haven't like really used GraphQL ever? Or just what is GraphQL? Could you give like a little like a sure. example? Yeah, I've do never worked my... so maybe it's not putting you on the spot, but I'm <laughs> saying not really. <laughs> I have repos full of notes for moments like this. So um, uh, you mentioned the GitHub. GraphQL API. So let's take a look at that. All right. All right. We're, we're um, deep into the matrix. I've never shared my deep in the matrix. I've never shared my screen with uh, Discord before. So we'll see if I can succeed yeah. at this. I'm, I'm hoping your Mac doesn't second. say it needs screen sharing permissions. It might. <laughs> it, it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I mean, no, I mean, uh, just say yes. It's like, it's going to open up uh, maybe the accessibility or screen sharing. It, it okay. might, yeah, it might can, ask you to restart Discord for a sec. See, I told okay. you we would mess something up technical at some point, Eve. I told you. Yeah, it wouldn't be a stream yeah. with us if we didn't mess up something, so it's okay. All right. Wow. Boom. Okay. It's not right. to quit. And I was like, I don't want to, so I'm glad it works without having to do that. Um, okay, cool. So you mentioned the GitHub API. That's kind of the first big um, company that made a big bet on GraphQL as far as like exposing this public API that you can interact with. So mm -hmm. if you take a look at the, the, these docs are kind of in, progress of being changed, but the GitHub API Explorer, ooh, I just realized that this sort of broke one of my classes in this <laughs> new interface. <laughs> so upsetting. I'm going to compartmentalize that for later to worry about. Um, uh, so we'll just sign in with GitHub here. And down here, this is kind of a pretty common user interface for those who have, uh, oh, there we go. Um, for those who have worked with um, like Postman before, this is how you send queries to a GraphQL API. So um, this will allow you to actually interact with your live data. Over here on the left-hand side is your query. Um, okay. 
It says it keeps pausing the screen. I don't know why it's doing that. Your stream is still running. I want to keep my stream running. There we go. Um, <laughs> what on earth? So sad. So here on the, the Discord doing it. Yeah, it says your stream is still running. We've paused this preview to save your resources. Mm. <laughs> I don't want that, but that's fine. I can handle it. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll press do on. This. Go, so, go. So here on the left, that's our query. It's going to ask for any fields that we want back from our data. Here we have the little play button. So this is going to, once I click play, return all of the data for those fields. So nice. that's the simplest way of describing kind of a GraphQL query. It's being sent to a single GraphQL endpoint. And any field that I ask for is what it's going to return. The query itself and the response match exactly. So no extra fields unlike REST where you might send a query for a viewer and then you get back everything <laughs> in a big blob of JSON. <laughs> in this case, we're just asking for a single field. So this is kind of, this is a really good one to play around with if you are new to GraphQL or if you aren't. I look at it all the time because I really like to take a look at how this API is put together. So in addition to the query language, we have this schema definition language. The schema definition language describes like a language for describing all of your types. So if we're working on a project together for GitHub, we would then think about all of the queries we would want to be able to send, as well as all of the objects. So um, users, repositories, issues, those are kind of the nouns of <laughs> that API. And then we're going to just bake that all into the schema. So what's really cool about this is we can, using this documentation panel, which every one of the GraphQL APIs has something that looks sort of like this, we can take a look at what are all of these fields. So we don't have to send a bunch of pings to a REST API, like a REST API. We don't have to send a bunch of pings to it and be like, what fields are available? This is confusing all those types of things. Um, instead, we can just look at this in the schema tab here, and that's going to give us all of that good information. I think the first time I saw GraphQL, that was like my favorite part because it was like right after I had learned about like sending for like REST APIs and stuff and like grabbing things and like the steps you have to go through to get that. And I had been like teaching that and I was just like, I saw GraphQL and I was like, oh, that's so much nicer. It's just so much better. So yeah, that's kind of it's one of the round. Sorry. Oh, no, I was gonna say in terms of the when you're doing the query, like you can like you mentioned, you can pick what you want to return. Uh, from like a because like with a, a REST interface, like you might say, like, you know, get customer or something, and it returns exactly what that contract is so like all those fields of the customer uh but in the context of graphql where you can pick and choose what you want to return is uh like are there any i imagine there's some kind of security that you can implement to say you know i mean like i don't know i can get all the users but i can't get like an admin users info because obviously that would be bad uh, there's I'm just curious how that works in terms of handling like a scenario like that yeah, so basically on the back end of this API, it's going to serve up both the schema, so that type system, all of the different types, but also the way that the data is fulfilled is by um, writing these resolver functions that go get the data from wherever it is. So okay. think about, I don't know, think about any project you're working on. You probably have a bunch of different data sources, maybe a bunch of REST APIs or databases. GraphQL gives us this way of pulling everything together in one spot. So in those functions, we can say, hey, go get our users from the users in the Mongo database, and then go get our, I don't know, repositories from the REST API for repos. That's not how the GitHub API works, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. um, and then as far as like authentication goes, you would just build that into those functions. So you would say, um, if we have a token for the user, 
return the data to them. If okay. you don't, then don't. Um, so yeah, all of that can be built into the GraphQL server itself. And then you can, <laughs> yeah, you don't wanna just open up all of your data to everyone, that's scary. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that will help yeah. a lot. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I figured there was something there in place to do it because from the outside, having not really done a lot, it just, it just sounded like, here's everything, pick what you want, you know, like going into the candy store kind of, so. Totally. And there's also ways of setting up security on the API as well. So a uh, question I get a lot is like, oh, so we're going to open up a public API and you're just going to let me send as big of a query as I want. You're just going to let anyone DDoS me <laughs> and people get really stressed out and upset which is understandable yep. but what you can set up on the server is you can say maybe limit the depth of the query or limit the complexity of the query or even more hard line you can set up a list of queries that are acceptable you can set up a list of clients that are acceptable and all of that can help to yeah just make it such that people don't ddos you which okay. is not desirable. One hundred percent. In most cases. <laughs> All cases. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you're trying to test something. I don't know. <laughs> so, so I see down at the bottom there. There's query variables. So like right now you're showing us like okay, let's go get some viewer information. Uh, let's go get like your user from uh, GitHub. But I imagine like like SQL or, or like even like a, you know, making a call in a REST API, you can say, go get me user X and so on. Uh, that I imagine, is that what the query variables are there or? Yeah, that's exactly why that's there. So let me see if I can remember how this repo works or how this API works. It kind of can. So we have a repository query here. This takes in the name and the owner of the repo. So I'll say name. Mm, what do I want to look for? Uh, React. <laughs> and then owner is Facebook. This okay. used to work. I don't know if it still does. Then we can, um, if I hit, sorry, uh, I have to keep on pausing that. If I hit control space, that's going to surface a whole list of the fields that are available, just okay. kind of like the documentation panel does. This will say, oh, hey, we can see when was the React repo created? So this will tell us that, and I know the screen isn't looking great, um, but this is gonna tell us that the React repo was created at uh, 4.15 <laughs> on May 24th, 2013. So this is that idea of kind of filtering data with GraphQL. So your question, which I didn't answer at all, is <laughs> about the query variables panel. Um, yeah. I'm getting there. The query variables are how we send dynamic data to the query. So here we're kind of sending it in line as a string. We're just saying Facebook, React, but Picture this connected to a front-end application, a client-side app, where we have a drop-down that, or a field that's collecting data from the user. Um, the way that we can set up our query to handle this is we can set up these variables. So uh, we're going to add a variable with the dollar sign for name. So I'll say name. And name, you just would match the type. So it's I'm going to guess that it's a string. Then we can grab the owner. So owner, again, dollar sign. You can call these variables whatever you want them to be called. Um, it's just like any other variable. And then you would assign this. The thing that's important is you have to say that it's a string. Mm -hmm. Now what I can do is instead of using these, uh, instead of using these hard-coded strings, I can assign that to the name. And then I can assign the owner. So dollar sign uh, owner. It's right there. I don't know why I forgot. Um, and then we, in the query variables panel, in the lower left-hand corner is where we're going to kind of mimic the experience of the client by sending those values. So we're just okay. going to pass those in as JSON. So I can say name. Uh, and then again, we'll, let's say GraphQL. This might not be there anymore. 
if this breaks, that's okay. We'll fix it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's okay. And so we have this little JSON object here that we're going to provide. We click play to send the query. And yeah, we see that shortly after <laughs> in the <laughs> progression of uh, time on July 1st at 126, we created the GraphQL repo at Facebook. So this is how we would accept dynamic data into a query. And this is all built into, we've talked about the spec a couple of times, this is all baked into that spec itself. So if you ever wanna take a look at the GraphQL spec, you can. Uh, you can, it's light reading for a weekend or something like that. But this will tell you everything that you need to know about the query language. So literally this syntax is defined. Oh man, I, the preview is so rough. Uh, so the, the this would show you all of the features of that language. So um, all of that syntax is defined there. And what's really cool about the GraphQL spec, unlike the React community, not the React community, the React team is part of Facebook. The GraphQL yeah. team is an open source project. So it's really a an independent thing that's managed by all these different companies and vendors and things like that that use GraphQL. So it's managed a little bit more like the Node.js foundation or something like that. It's okay. this group of shadowy figures that decide <laughs> what is in the future of the language. But, um, but that's what I think is really cool about GraphQL. I made that class that we talked about for LinkedIn Learning in 2016. And mm -hmm. we, in the class, go through all of the kind of coolest features of the uh, GitHub GraphQL API. And the class still works, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> shocking for, I don't know, typing code into anything and recording it, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> it still yeah. changes a lot. <laughs> and you feel like you have to change this, but we can, even as the tools change in the ecosystem, we can feel confident that learning about the query language will eventually, it will serve us well because it doesn't really change. Yeah. And nice. uh, that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but this is, this is really cool. This, uh, so graph, graph EQL is, is like the standard kind of like playground is the term, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, so yeah. yeah, there no, are others too. The, there we go. So like the graph field playground is another one that you'll see a lot. Uh, okay. This is a fake ski resort. <laughs> With the real GraphQL API. Oh man, my screen sharing is so whack today, but that's okay. Snowtooth.moonhighway.com. You can take a look at that. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of different options, but all will give you that awesome thing that you talked about, which is like the ability to look at what fields are available and what queries we can send. Yeah, I find it uh, having not really done a ton except for like a minor tweaks in my Gatsby site like I said uh, I find it very approachable like I've done SQL uh, uh, you know uh, and in terms of a query language like it definitely feels more comfortable because it, it's like JavaScript like you know because it's it's returning JSON you're writing queries in JSON <clears throat> so it's yes it, it's its own query language but I think from because I, I think originally this was also to help front end scale very quickly with back end work. It, I, feel, I feel like that's kind of one of the reasons why the project came about too. Uh, but uh, it definitely seems just really super approachable because, uh, you know, if you're doing something like, well, I guess SQL is approachable too. I don't know. I haven't done a ton of SQL recently, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just find like this doesn't hurt my brain. Yeah. That's the yeah. best way I can explain it. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, I would prefer that everything not hurt my brain. So that is <laughs> one of the nice things about working with GraphQL, definitely. <laughs> At least the query language part. Now, in, in terms of the, like, I'm looking at the query there. So you have the, the types defined. Is is the exclamation mark, does that mean it's 
uh, optional or something, or or is that just the way the syntax is for putting a type? So anytime you see an exclamation mark, it means that it can't return or can't send null as the value. So okay. it is required. So we wouldn't be able to get away with sending uh, a name and no owner, for example. The query would break. We okay. need to provide that. OK, so then the, the query would obviously error out before anything happens. So. Yeah, exactly. So that's why that schema kind of exists, is to enforce these types. See, as soon as I remove the exclamation mark, it, we see the underline red next to the <laughs> variable. It's mad. Yeah. Yeah, it will cause an error. Okay. Nullability mismatch. So yeah, that's what the schema is in charge always. <laughs> so and in, there in we terms go. of I'm gonna I'm gonna just kind of dig in some questions because I, I just never yeah. don't, I really don't know the answers, but can you do stuff like you know, like in JavaScript you can do default uh, values for parameters and so on? Uh, is that something that exists in the query language? Yeah, definitely. So you would just do that with an equal sign and then whatever you want the name to be. Okay. So that removes that that removes that uh, underline red thing. It's less upset now. Then if I decide not to supply or I'm not supposed to supply an owner, Facebook. Uh, oh wait, that's wrong. <laughs> so the name, <laughs> I'm getting the owner and the name confused. Okay. All right, yeah, let's yeah. try that again. So owner, how about that? We'll say it's a string. If no one provides a value, just make it for solo. Cool. Then I can say um, name. This has to be based on name is, I should have remembered one of my repo names. I think that's probably one of them. We'll see. And then if I don't supply an owner, I should be able to send the query. That'll give me back whatever time I created it. Okay. I'm glad that existed. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in in terms of queries, like right now, we're doing somewhat simple queries, like we're just passing in a couple parameters. Uh, again, I imagine you can do more complex queries, you know, like get stuff within a, a date range or, you know, you know, just stuff that you people might be used to uh, doing with like a, a SQL query, perhaps. Uh, uh, I imagine that's possible. Definitely. So you would just add that to the schema. So okay. things like filtering based on different criteria, um, perhaps sending ranges in GraphQL arguments for like between certain dates. Um, pagination is a big one too. So maybe I have a thousand users and I don't wanna bring back a thousand users all the time. Uh, in the GitHub API, let's see, you see a lot of times, I'm not gonna try it because I don't remember the, <laughs> I don't <laughs> remember what it is, uh, but a lot of these fields have uh, an argument called first and last on it. So okay. first would give you the first 10 and last would give you the last 10, things like that. So yeah, it, as long as you bake it into the schema, you add it to that document. And literally the schema is just a, uh, let's see, it's literally just a file that uses this schema definition language. Let's see okay. if we can. Mm -hmm. Fire that up in VS Code. Um, two screens. Sometimes I don't make it all the way. Um, <laughs> so this is what. Can you see the VS Code? Okay. Uh, it's, it's getting it's, there. It's yeah. It's, trying to uh, load. It's Thinking about it. Together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see gondola. Okay, all right. Yeah, there we go. There it is. <laughs> so this is another one that. Um, yeah, we're just trying to see an example of the schema definition language. So this is it. You go through and you define all the fields that are on each type. You can set up optional, but I think a good idea to add uh, documentation. So mm -hmm. you can add the pound sign over each one of these fields and 
really describe what that is. So then it's double documented sort of. So people who are consuming your API, whether those are developers or members of the public, whoever is <laughs> consuming this data, they'll be able to uh, see what that is. So yeah, all that really happens in this document. And what's really cool about a schema is if we're all working on a project together and maybe we work in different domains, we can decide on what the schema is and then go work on our own projects and we kind of know what we're building. And then it makes it kind of, it makes it easier to mock this data as well and get started. So if I have a chairlift, all my examples are ski examples because I'm a freak. Um, the <laughs> ski example here though, um, if I wanted to mock this data, I could fairly, fairly easily because I always know that I need to return an ID for an ID. I always yeah. need to return a string for a string and it really empowers both the client side developer and the back end developer to have kind of an agreement on what are we trying to build here? And then we can each go about doing so. Yeah, no, for sure. Nice. Uh, yeah, I like working that even though I haven't really worked in a professional project with GraphQL. I like I like knowing like this is the shape of things and I, I can right away just go start doing things and, and just assume that that other part's going to get done. So uh, no, that's nice. And definitely with the types too, it helps. Uh, uh, I've done quite a bit of TypeScript. So I imagine there is probably tools that generate the types for you for TypeScript, which give you all the IntelliSense and everything. You got it. Yeah. So if you are working with TypeScript, there's something called GraphQL code gen that does that. So okay. it will literally just look at these types and generate the types for TypeScript. Um, Apollo has a tool for it as well. Uh, the Apollo CLI will do that too. So I have a, there's a blog on Moon Highway that isn't super old if you want to know how to set that up. Um, okay. And I wrote that so that I would know how to do it later because <laughs> I can never find how to do it on the docs. Okay. So um, that's something that really helps a lot, I think, because why not benefit from the schema if you can to make your life easier. And then as the schema changes, you can regenerate types and it's all okay. pretty cool stuff. That's nice. nice. And we were we were talking a bit before about like, you know, authentication and like who can see what and all that. I imagine given the same GraphQL server, we could serve up or expose different schemas based on particular roles or authentication. Or is that how you would do that? Or do you just use the same schema and then use the resolver like you were saying to do that or? Yeah, it would probably be. It in most cases, we're going to have one schema in the GraphQL project. So I say that not always, like people do break down their schemas into different parts, but for the most part, you're going to create just that single schema. I'm trying to okay. pull up a quick example here. I, right, waiting for things to load, dance. This is the pet library here. Uh, the pet library is a place where you can check out and check in pets like they are books. And <laughs> in this, we have a couple, let's look at the schema first. Let's pull out that screen. Let's go. Um, so we have our type definitions here in this type def.graphql file. Okay. Now, if we scroll down to the, let's see. If we scroll down to the mutation type, so we talked about a query. What a mutation is, is it's a uh, basically all of the verbs, all of the actions that are part of your uh, part of your server. So okay. within our within our type definitions here, I don't know if you can see it particularly yeah. well. There's a create account mm -hmm. mutation. There's also a login mutation, and there's checkout and check-in. So in order to check in or check out pets at the pet library, you have to be, you have to have created a, an account and you have to have logged in. So the way that this is working on the back end is all kind of defined by these resolver functions. So if we look at this mutation JS file, 
So inside of this, it's going to, we're just using JSON web tokens for this, but okay. we're basically saying every time we create a new account, let's see if we can get that up. Every time we create a new account, we're going to generate a new customer, but we're going to generate a, a new token for them as well. Then when we log them in, we're going to um, kind of validate those tokens. And then what that will help us do is once that person is logged in, we can save that somewhere and then they won't be able to check out or check in any pets unless they're um, authenticated, unless they're allowed to. So okay. this particular example uses a Mongo database on the back end, but I mentioned before, you don't have to use any particular data storage. A lot of times people will ask like, do you have to use a graph database to work with GraphQL? And the answer is absolutely not. You can use any data source that you'd like. And yes. and I guess in terms of tools, that's getting a lot easier for the, because I know uh, uh, I took uh, Jason Langsdorf's serverless course on front end masters, and it was just really quick to set up with, uh, there's a product called Hasura and it was, Mm -hmm. Basically, basically, it was a Postgres database, but then all of a sudden, it was able to bootstrap a GraphQL server like without me having to do anything. Which, from a developer experience, I, that's kind of nice. Like, because I imagine in the early days, folks were literally crafting these servers, making the queries, and I'm sure the tooling has gotten way, way better since then. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different approaches to creating a GraphQL server. Um, Kind of the way I've done it here, the Apollo server way is to start with the schema and then write the resolver functions to return data. So that's sort of what you're talking about, kind of like the by hand whittling a schema together. <laughs> and there's a lot of nice benefits to that because it allows you to get started without really writing too much code and you can pull everybody together to make that happen. But there's also a lot of tools like Hesera you mentioned and Prisma and some other things. Uh, these are tools that will auto-generate a schema for you based on your data. Oh, okay. So if you have an existing database or um, some sort of a data source that you like already, you can be like, build me a schema <laughs> and it'll do it really quickly. And then okay. serve up a GraphQL API for you. But I, I see what you mean, though, with like, because like, like, as you've whittled this one, as you said, uh, because yeah. you're a little closer to the theoretical metal, uh, like, because it's GraphQL, you can pull in any data sources. So you could literally have like a, a static JSON file, you could hook into your Mongo, if for whatever reason, you could go to a Postgres DB and and in terms of the interface, it's just somebody going to a login or the checkout, like you're saying. So that, I don't know, I, I, that definitely seems really cool from a, just from a DX perspective and also just encapsulating things. Uh, you know, it just, you know, in, ter in uh, keeping up with the theme of not hurting our brains too much, you know, it, uh, it's definitely yeah. nice for that. Well, particularly when you go start to work in an area that you haven't really explored too much before, like if you're starting at a new company or mm -hmm. onboarding to a new project, there's probably a ton of different data sources and people on the team are like, yeah, 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 we know this data comes from here. And it, there's a lot of like <laughs> anecdotal information that yeah. lives in people's heads about where the data actually comes from. If you build a schema and serve up your data sources, everything is at the single layer. And while that does require a bit of setup, I can think of a lot of benefits there because mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to like ask people where the data is. You can just go find it at this one place. And when you do go find it, it's at a nice little graphical interface like the playground or graphical, something like this, where you have nice documentation and you can see the schema and I don't know. That's pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Now, uh, I'll, I'll ask my semi-tough question, but uh, obviously GraphQL comes with all these great benefits that you've explained. The developer experience seems to be pretty nice. Uh, 
what obviously rest apis still exist uh you know what you know in and i get i guess the answer is it depends but like when when would you say it's like a great idea to really use graphql versus like you know the rest api is working but like it, is it really just for when you want to aggregate data sources that that's when the red flag goes off to say i, I gotta go graphql or um i think aggregation is a good place that makes a whole lot of sense if you do have a lot of data sources um especially for client-side developers who are like where is this data where is it coming from this is <laughs> this is chaos um it's a nice place to um add a bit of organization orchestration to your data sources um places where it gets a little trickier is um let's say you have in a lot of cases folks want to create this kind of one-to-one -one map of their database, which oftentimes that goes well. Oftentimes that can be a little chaotic because maybe you have thousands of table fields and like you have to, you start to make a one-to-one -one map of chaos and the schema then is chaos and okay. the benefits that you get aren't as visible, I guess. So I would say, um, not to say that it never works, but I have talked to folks who tried GraphQL, maybe ran an automated process to generate a schema, and it generated this really huge document with thousands of lines of schema. And it's okay. like, this is the same problem we have <laughs> in our existing setup. So yeah, why create it at that point? Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. It's, uh, yeah. And, uh, I guess if uh, we... Nick, I just want to just mention real quick that you for the for the timing you had the top of the hour, by the way. So uh, don't want to don't want to take up too much of Eve's time. She's got other things, but yeah, yeah, we yeah. may want to wrap it up at some point soon. Yeah, yeah, that, that's me just uh, <laughs> just being too excited. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, no, definitely don't want to keep you because I know you have lots of things on the go. Um, but uh, I guess uh, I guess I guess at this point I guess we'll tie things up then. Thank you for the time check, Christina. <laughs> um, no problem. Yeah. Uh, so this is really cool. Uh, like you said, we can check out. Uh, well, Christina's gonna post the links at the in the chat again. But uh, mm -hmm. we can check out the GraphQL spec. We can check out uh, your company, Moon Highway. Uh, you have some You have a bunch of example repos there as well. Uh, and uh, I can't remember the name of the course I took, but it's it's like that one hour intro. What, what's that course called again? Yeah, it's called GraphQL is for everyone, and okay. we haven't scheduled any dates for 2021, but we're going to be, so um, keep an eye out for that. We definitely will have some of those coming, um, and we also have an email course that's coming out as part of the GraphQL workshop thing, so if okay. you sign up nice. on the website, I'm not trying to steal your email for nefarious purposes, <laughs> just to um, send you some kind of first steps with the query language and schema language if you're interested. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, and Eve also has courses on React, a newer course on React hooks that just came out, right, Eve? Mm -hmm. Yep. And Webpack and others. So definitely check Eve out and her, her other things she teaches. Cool. Well, I just wanted to say uh, super thanks for coming on, Eve. I know you have a lot on the go, so it's really grateful that you had a an hour to spare for us uh, and and chat with us and all our silliness you're making it seem like i'm much busier than i am but <laughs> okay okay maybe you're, you're watching an netflix important person. i have places to be like yeah 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 exactly <laughs> cool not really <laughs> awesome well thanks again uh christina i think is gonna drop uh, all those links in the chat and uh yep yeah i dropped them Cool. Well, well, thanks again yeah. and uh, enjoy any time off if you're taking any off. I don't know if you are for the holidays or if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or something else, but uh, enjoy a bit of time off, hopefully. And uh, we'll see you in the new year, maybe. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, thanks again.
Uh, all right. Well, take care, everybody. Uh, just to mention for the stream, uh, Christina and I are going to be off for the holidays. So the stream is going to be coming back in January. Uh, we, we've got some exciting folks coming on. Uh, Gantt Laborde is going to be coming from Infinite Red, probably doing some machine learning craziness. Uh, we got Jerome Hardwick uh, from Vets Who Code is going to be talking with us, too. And we got a few others. Uh, won't give too many spoilers. Yeah. And Oh yeah, and Ben, uh, co-founder and our very own Dev. Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got our own Ben. I don't know if you have a Ben, but we have a Ben. So uh, yeah, so is that too. Oh. So. <laughs> cool. Well, take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.